In today's video, you'll learn about the nuances of social impact in rural America, as well as the challenges and opportunities for corporate social responsibility professionals, and highlight crucial partnerships needed to drive change. Finally, we'll uncover why the health of rural America is vital for social impact growth. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Carl. Welcome to the Social Impact Show, a channel where you get the latest strategies and tips to help you scale and grow your CSR and goodness programs. So today, my guest today is Andrew Jones. He is the senior researcher at the conference board. And we're talking about investing in rural America surrounding corporate citizenship. So first of all, thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us today. And let's get right into it. I guess, what do we mean by rural America? And maybe I'll, I'll preface it with, I've seen maps where you know, the concentrations of population are on a very few places in, 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 in America, but the rest are literally empty. So what does rural America mean? Thanks. Thanks so much, Carl. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And, and, and just to clarify for those who aren't perhaps familiar with the conference board, we are a leading nonprofit, nonpartisan, business-oriented think tank that's been serving its members and society for over a hundred years, actually, and rural America, yeah, and 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 I should add that we've just completed a big sort of research project into corporate citizenship in rural America. So we've been we've been working on this for for a while now, and uh, yeah, I think rural. When you talk about rural America, right, it brings to the minds of certain things, right? See where scenic landscapes, open spaces, farming, small towns, communities, but there's actually no official single fixed definition of rural in the U.S. Right, and I think that that speaks to you. So seeing different maps and seeing different things on those maps. Uh, you know, the federal government has several definitions, right, that vary across its its departments and even within those departments. So it can be very confusing for a non-expert audience, and 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 it can look very different depending on the definition, right? Rural areas can be as, as small as towns with with two thousand people, or even as large as sort of sort of larger, let's say, peri-urban areas of up to fifty thousand people, right? So it very much depends on the definition you're using and the purpose you're using it for. A common method is often simply to to classify each county in the US. So see the county is the sort of the building box geographically into either urban or rural, although that often cannot be ideal because most counties contain a mix of urban and rural. A more precise approach is often to use sort of borrow from the US census, which uses sort of smaller geographical units called census tracts uh, and and classifies each one depending on you know the amount of people, the population density, the proximity to an urban area, commuting links and so on. And in our recent work, we actually use a definition of rural based on the most recent U.S. census, which, which according to that, uh, about 20% of the total U.S. population lives in rural areas, and actually, which is about 67 million people. And also that represents about 97% of the country's total land mass. So very, very interesting. To, uh, the, the question of definitions is one that is persistent in this area. But we use the census because I think it's most precise. And, and so what are some of the most common societal challenges in rural America? I, I guess speaking to the previous point, obviously rural areas, there is no single rural America, right? Rural areas are, are very diverse and we, sh we should be cautious of making you know, big, uh, big assumptions and big generalizations. Uh, lots of people see rural America as, as you know, synonymous with, with white, but actually a, a quarter of the rural population is actually people of color uh, and and. There's been lots of sort of regional differences. So having said that, I think there are several socioeconomic challenges that are common to many rural areas in the US. So I think on the economic front, we often see a, a lack of economic opportunities and higher incidences of poverty compared to, to urban areas. On the social side, we, we I think there's many things you can point out, but we often see a lack of decent healthcare access, which is in part due to sort of declining number of facilities. We see lower educational attainment in many rural areas, which is perhaps due to a lack of funding and resources. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of environmental challenges in, in rural areas. Uh, climate change is having a significant impact, including you know more frequent natural disasters. And it, it's worth adding that that these, while the challenges obviously vary across the country and vary by specific rural community, I think when you look at it as a whole, these various challenges can entrench a perception in many rural companies. Uh, sorry, very many rural communities are being left behind, right? Perhaps being overlooked in national debates, perhaps being overlooked in economic policy, which in turn can fuel 
political polarization in the US as a whole. So you know, the rural areas are very important and, and need to be recognized. Now, I did my, I guess, my MBA in urban, urban economics, but more so taking a look at the urban and rural kind of divide. And one of the things, and this was close to like nearly a decade ago, but when we're looking at, you're right though, every single state or up here in Canada, uh, every single province, the the rural challenges are a bit different. Mm. And are you still seeing the, is there still a, a flux of migration from rural to urban, which does have, you know, economic, political implications? I think it very much does depend on where you're looking at, right? And also going back to the other question, what definition you're using, right? I think some some definitions of rural actually suggest huge uh, rural to urban migration. Uh, the census definition, which we use, which perhaps comes out of a slightly larger number, doesn't. So I think it does depend how you're defining boundaries and how you're even determining what rural is. Ha- having said that, I think, yeah, as a whole, you do see a pull from many urban centers. But I, I think that's perhaps quite logical when you think of you know where the economic opportunities are in the US, you know, where the educational opportunities are. And it goes back to my brief point that perhaps many rural areas have been slightly left behind, you know, in terms of processes of, in, uh, of globalization, the decline of traditional manufacturing industries, the rise of, of tech sectors in, in places like New York City and San Francisco have been a big, I guess, a big brain drain on rural talent, which in turn further perpetuates some of these challenges we're talking about. So you definitely, I think mean, that is a definite persistent phenomenon. So let's shift to, you know, the topic of philanthropy and mm. what is that, what's the state of philanthropy in rural America? Because you hear about it in, you know, urban cities and, and corporations, but like, what is that? What, what is philanthropy in rural America? And, and how does it also, I guess, what's the state of corporate citizenship as well? Given all those wide range of challenges we just spoke about, you, you might expect rural America broadly defined to be a major target and recipient of philanthropic dollars, right? But that's actually simply not the case. You know, a, a recent major study by the US government actually found that only about 5% or so of, of major grants by large philanthropic foundations, which includes you know corporates and, and the corporate affiliated foundations, are directed to rural-based partners, right? We think when we know, as we heard earlier, that rural areas represent 20% of the total population, this is actually a, a pretty big gap, right? And and I think what this reflects is it's really an urban bias among perhaps among corporate funders. You know, very few foundations and very few major corporations are headquartered in rural areas. Very few make reference to rural areas in their public reporting. Uh, we actually had a a, an, a recent, very recent survey of corporate citizen executives at the conference board who actually found that only about 9% consider rural development to be a, a priority issue. So, so there's a big blind spot here, right? And um, much room for improvement because while while few companies are obviously headquartered in rural parts of the US, they all depend on it. You know, whether it's for for employees, for operations, for supply chains. So there's there's big room for improvement here, I think, in in philanthropy in general and specifically in corporate citizenship. And so you touched on this. <clears throat> what are some of the, I guess, what are some of the challenges that companies have in relation to their you know, corporate citizenship, social impact efforts, you know, trying to to do that in a rural area. And then what are some ways to overcome that? Because like I said, most of the, obviously you're going to try to get your philanthropic or corporate citizenship programs in the places where you get the most return from it, the most people involved. But then in rural, in rural areas, you have a more sparse population or the population is more spread out. So like, are there solutions or different types of programs than the traditional employee engagement or sorry, not employee engagement, but I mean like those traditional in volunteering donation, giving yeah. matching, what does that look like in a rural area? Sure. Sure. So I think there's, I think there's two sides to this. So I think on, on the first time there's this perhaps the barriers that are inhibiting companies from, from doing more and, and, we did. We did ask in our in our work in our survey. Our, we did a survey of companies that are doing you know, corporate citizenship efforts in rural areas, or predominantly doing so. And we actually found there was a number of barriers, and and the key ones that really stood out, I think, were was limited 
direct presence of, of the corporate in the rural area. Limit, and I guess going with that limited understanding of the rural communities and their needs, which I think suggests a more general lack of familiarity and engagement with rural communities, right? And we actually make a series of recommendations in our, in our recent report about how companies can address this, but one that stood out in particular is actually hiring from rural areas, right? You know, actively recruiting and developing rural talent. Companies can just do that directly. You can also use citizenship and philanthropy to to partner with local educational institutions and workforce development programs and actually create pathways and pipelines for rural youth and professionals. So it's very much you know, that kind of focus on on workforce and upskilling that, as you say, goes be beyond a bit faster to traditional donations and, and volunteering. Um, I, we could, I think there's also an issue around a further, a further impediment that we banned was the perceived capacity of rural nonprofits, right? right? Rightly or wrongly, rural nonprofit partners uh, are often perceived as lacking capacity compared to their urban counterparts. So and I think there's a bunch of reasons for that, right? You're lacking funding, lacking expertise, as you say, those smaller populations that lead to sort of smaller impact estimates and inability to meet matching fund requirements. And I think there's a huge potential here for companies to really support and build rural nonprofits, right? And, and partly that's, I think, one aspect of that is making grants for general operating support that don't come with administrative donors. You could you could describe as trust based philanthropy. Uh, also, perhaps companies should consider, and this is a recommendation we make in our work, that partner with regional foundations, right? Regional funders, as they, these are likely to already have those established relationships and understand the specific challenges, opportunities in local communities. So I think, I think those are perhaps a, 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 the key barriers that have been inhibiting companies, and also some hopefully practical, forward looking ways that companies can address them and move the needle. In, in rural areas. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think like when we talk about the type, I guess the types of programs that companies are looking at, right? So in urban areas, you have certain specific type of issues, whether it's uh, poverty, whether it's uh, hunger, whether it's like there's different challenges. I, I'm curious to know, like, what are some of the social, economic, social economic issues that corporations, companies are looking to address in rural Americas? And I guess, is there a difference in urban versus rural challenges? Yeah, when we did our survey of, of companies doing doing citizenship in rural areas, we did sort of inquire into what, what are the key issues you're addressing? I think some really interesting findings. I think on the, on the economic side, we found that the majority of companies active in this space are, are really focusing on sort of skills, employment trainment, also supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs, right? I think I think this makes sense when you think about sort of trying to cultivate economic opportunity in underserved, in underserved areas, uh, trying to sort of build, I guess, a more diverse economy, more resilient economy, raise the general level of skill so so rural residents can sort of access, I guess, higher paying and more technical jobs. And, and there's some really interesting programs, right? We actually went to visit um, Peoria, Illinois. Peoria is, uh, is, is, is a sort of, rural hub almost in central Illinois. And, and it's also where the birthplace of the company Caterpillar, right? So we were very generously hosted by by Caterpillar. And Caterpillar are doing, see Caterpillar are a very technical company. Caterpillar are really investing big resources in STEM education, workforce development in Peoria. And obviously there's a, there's a societal purpose there. They are contributing to the community's growth. But at the same time, they're also helping shape a more skilled talent pipeline for themselves, right? Uh, so there's a sort of business and societal purpose there. Um, and we've seen we've seen similar programs in in other rural areas as well. In terms of you, you asked about sort of, and I think there's many social challenges that the companies are addressing. In addition to you know, education, we, we see companies addressing health. We see companies addressing food security, youth development. I think you asked about sort of perhaps something where challenges are maybe slightly different from urban areas. Something that we really found that a, a significant minority of companies are, are doing or are interested in doing is investing in high speed broadband. Uh, and this, I think this is super important, right? Because a significant number of rural Americans lack access to high speed broadband, the so called digital divide. The COVID 19 pandemic in particular exposed the social implications of that. And this is, this is a huge need that perhaps you don't really see at the same intensity in urban environments. And a lot of companies are investing in this. Uh, telecommunications firms have made massive investments in, in rural broadband. AT, AT&T, actually, in the last few years, has invested $2 billion. In closing the digital divide, and and 
there's obviously a, a business motivation for them to do so, but it also encompasses, you know, their community engagement and philanthropy work. So some really interesting socioeconomic initiatives going on in rural areas. So one thing I'm really curious to know is uh, what impact has, I guess, remote work, like, mm. I guess, during the pandemic, post the pandemic, of, I guess, the philanthropic or CSR or corporate citizenship efforts? Because I think, you know, there was a rise in virtual volunteering mm. Right, mm. when people couldn't get together. So has there any been lingering impacts or current impacts of that remote kind of culture where ne- you don't necessarily need people to like live in urban cities. They could stay in remote or rural areas and, you know, do kind of very similar work. For, for sure. And I think that's obviously been one of the, like one of the phenomenons of the pandemic, right? Where you've had, you've had people relocating uh, who perhaps had, you know, white collar office city jobs and have relocated to whether it's rural areas or, or you know smaller hometowns because they can continue to do that work right and i think that brings with it certain implications for the business obviously around, around you know commercial real estate and, and salaries and so on but it does present a real opportunity i think for for i guess the retention of you know that sort of more skilled expertise talent and higher paid talent in rural towns and, and the knock-on positive benefits that can have and i think this is again why perhaps it's so important to focus on issues like the digital divide because it's ultimately trying to cultivate a a more sophisticated and developed and modern infrastructure right and i guess you need that infrastructure infrastructure in the broad sense including internet that that, that will allow you to retain that kind of talent so i, I think that's that's just one of many i think uh sort of interesting uh consequences of, of the pandemic and that shift to remote work and and a remote learning as well. You know, to address the digital divide, I- I'm sure there's a lot of companies that need to partner up with different organizations. Mm-hmm. And like you mentioned, regional organizations that, you know, maybe have the networks already built in. So what are some key partnerships that companies need to scale and I guess drive and scale their social impact efforts? Well, and I guess that includes the public sector as well. So we, we spoke out about some of the some of the main drivers for companies to that, that that might inhibit them from engaging in citizenship or, or drive them, and we we asked companies what 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 might influence you to to work in rural areas, um, and we heard a uh, quite a few different things, right? Where it's yeah, the opportunity, the specific needs, uh, the alignment with strategy. But what what is notable is that very few companies consider the extent and scope of government funding or programs, whether that's national, federal, state, local level. And uh, I guess to put it simply, policy makers and regulators just do not exert significant influence on rural citizenship efforts. And this is this is a huge opportunity, right? Because closer collaboration with policymakers can help revitalize communities. It can help expand rural prosperity. And I guess only to address these sort of complex challenges we talked about, you do need to have public-private sector collaboration, uh, particularly in over the last few years, as we've seen the the current administration introduce a number of. Uh, big pieces of legislation, being the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and more recently the Inflation Reduction Act that do include, you know, focus and funding for rural development. So we we go on in our in our recent work to sort of make some recommendations how companies can you know, practically closer align with the government. I won't get into all of those now, but I, I think a, a particularly key thing is 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 knowing what yeah the public sector is doing, you know, undertake an analysis of programs, pinpoint where, you know, your citizenship goals might overlap and where you can really come in. So for example, if the state government is investing in in high-speed broadband, a, t- a technology firm might partner to fund digital literacy. Similarly, if, if, a, if a local government is focused more on develop, delivering sort of core social services in rural areas, a company could come in and amplify that with investments into education, entrepreneurship, small business, etc. So I think there's, there's a huge opportunity for more effective public-private partnerships in rural areas. And I guess being able to to make that happen in practice will require a bit more work by both sides, I think, to, to better understand what the other is doing. And I think that, like you, like you mentioned earlier, that's state-by-state state basis, right? Because mm. the needs of the, I guess, the rural needs in terms of like social economic, social economic requirements in each state is very different. Like I've been, I, I remember I was watching a couple of shows, I guess documentaries where certain towns and even counties 
like there are people in need of, I guess, ec- like from an economic side, like significant economic, mm. uh, like pro, like because a lot of businesses are moving. You know, people are unemployed or underemployed. But then in other areas, it may be not like that. It may be more of a social. You know, mm. there's obviously the the opioid fentanyl crisis. So there's. I, I, to me, there's like there's so many opportunities for cor- corporate citizenship, CSR, social impact, and so on, in all these different communities outside of urban areas. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think really nicely, but and I, I think it just shows as well your, all your sort of examples. You said that yeah, this is all the stuff we're talking about here, where it's economic development, social issues, even environmental issues, right? Uh, mm-hmm. They are inherently local, right? You know, and and what might make sense for you know, a small agricultural town in, in the Midwest might not might not work as effectively in in a you know a town in in sort of the South East. So it, it is it is very much it is a case by case basis, right? And I guess to be able to do that effectively, citizenship and and social impact professionals in general, they obviously need to cultivate that kind of local expertise and that local knowledge. So one of the recommendations we make in our board is actually very much that when entering rural communities and partnering with rural, rural communities. Corporates and I guess impact professionals in general should very much you know enter with humility, you know, and, and enter as 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 listeners, you know, not not experts, and and really try and aspire for a genuine sort of spirit of, of partnership and, and co-creation because there's everything is so particular and specific. Yeah. Uh, so I know Andrew, I could talk about this for hours and on. Days. That's good. <laughs> and, but if if our audience wants to connect with you or learn more about the conference board or even the, the survey that you mentioned, what's the best place to reach? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm I'm very active on on LinkedIn, so very happy to engage with anyone who's interested in LinkedIn. Yeah, I think quite easy to find me, just Andrew Jones uh, at the conference board. I'd, I'd simply do a, a plug for the conference board in general. So I know we, we, you can find us quite easily through through your search engine. We have a wide range of publications and projects and initiatives, not just on citizenship, but across sort of, you know, the wealth of ESG, sustainability and, and business in general. So uh, yeah, I think keep an eye out for our resources. Uh, I think they're very useful and very practical and very forward looking. Learn from other social impact professionals by watching this playlist here. Thanks for tuning in and we'll catch our next episode.